Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to another session in our Women Lead webinar series brought to you by the Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, and I'm your host today, and we are delighted to bring yet another informative webinar to our Association of Professional Women. Now, our Women Lead webinars are designed for you, the professional leader in business, whether that means you're an aspiring woman leader or a woman leading people or projects, teams or an entire company or business. And we select topics and themes that support your goal to lead, achieve, and succeed more effectively in business. Now our webinar is just shy of an hour and uh, as we get towards the end, we'll start opening it up for questions. If you have a question, just submit it in the chat box and I will share that with our guest today. And let me tell you about our guest today. Um, the focus of the webinar today is the revenue generating value of employee engagement. And I'm so excited to introduce our thought leader today. Our thought leader for today is Lynn Brody. And let me just tell you a little bit about Miss Brody. Hang on just a second. So Lynn is the founder of Lynn Brody International, a firm dedicated to activating full brain access to get you into your flow so you can grow. And Lynn's 30 plus years of experience and tenure have provided her with a wealth of skills that she puts to work for you and your organization. She teaches you what multi-million dollar companies know while helping you multiply your intelligence, dramatically increase productivity, and bring your vision to the next level. Level. I love this particular line. Lynn unlocks the alchemy of you. So you have more impact using less energy. And who can't have a little bit more of that? So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our, our wonderful expert today, Lynn Brody. Take it away, Lynn. Hi, Patty. Thank you so much. And um, Connected Women of Influence, thank you for inviting me on this webinar to be able to share information um, with all the valuable members and everyone that is going to be looking at and listening to this. I'm excited to share the information with you on how to drive your revenue through getting um, employees more engaged, which is really a huge uh, issue um, ar around the country. And uh, Patty, it looks like you have control. I can't. Okay. Because I can see your mouse moving around. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> there we go. So until you get control of it, why don't you just tell me to move it for you in case you're not able to get it going? Okay. Um, so you can advance to the next slide. So, um, you know, here's some really astounding uh, at, data is that you know Gallup did a recent study that shows that employee engagement is only 15% worldwide that that is a devastating number to companies um, in trying to get their workforce more engaged in in what's happening and and in what's going on and it's not going to get any better if companies keep the course with their current business models so we're going to talk about why this is and and how we can go ahead and change it uh, next slide so current business models uh, and it's been like this for for a very long time has always been about profits and growing profits and so of course that's important you, you all businesses want to have a, a fantastic revenue stream and and to drive their revenue um, but there's still some very important other areas that uh, the new gen uh, generations are looking at and how to get them more engaged. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's oh, there we go. I didn't know if that was me or you in the slide. <laughs> that was you. you, you oh, that was me. Yeah. <laughs> 
There okay. we go. Ah, there we go. Because I was like, oh, I'm, I'm one more ahead. The, so in, in the current business model, also um, in, in looking at how you generate revenue and your profits, it's from your customers. And so you may, you may know your customers, or you may only know some of them, or you may, or you may not know them, depending upon what your model is. But do you know what their needs and their requirements are? Hmm. So in the next section of the current business model and your people um, are your employees. Now, depending on the size of the company, um, do, you, do you know who your employees are? I mean, like deeply, do you know who they are as people? You know, companies go through a very extensive and expensive hiring process, um, you know, between people applying or if they're hiring a company to help them uh, collect uh, resumes and speak with people and, um, you know, ta uh, talent companies that look to bring people forth for consideration. And they go through with their, with their staff a lengthy uh, interview process because they're looking for not only the cream rising to the top, but they're looking for the, a unique person with, with some unique skills. Um, but once the person gets inside and the person is hired, uh, it's very odd, but they don't really use those unique skills that have been hired. And, and the reason that people have been brought in, they rarely consider what people want, who they are, and are really looking at them as the worker bees uh, to obtain profits and just the path to obtain profits. I really liked these last two slides, Lynn, because I liked the fact that it's, okay, we're focusing on people, but often from the company's viewpoint, the people they're focusing on are the customers and mm -hmm. not so much the people that are delivering the service or delivering the product or might even be the closest to their customers. This is a really good, a good point. Thank you. And it's the key point in why there's such a lack of employee engagement mm -hmm. because you know, employees are thinking, well, you don't really care much about me. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of here, I'm collecting a paycheck and, but people really aren't considering my, my thoughts, my ideas. I, I'm, I'm not asked about my ideas and that's why you hired me for the uniqueness of what I bring to the table. So there's a huge disconnect in, in that area. And so it brings us also to the the third section um, uh, of connectability here, uh, and, and that's in giving back in philanthropy. So a lot of companies uh, might have a tab on their website that, that's their philanthropic page um, that might talk about something that they care about and that they donate a percentage of their profits to. Some companies also donate their time. But not, but not enough of them. And you're going to see going forward why this is a key area in employee engagement going forward as the workforce has changed. Hmm. So, uh, you know, in summary, the generations past have been about um, profits. And people have come to work, uh, you know, where I call it the, you know, they get up in the morning and they're like, time to make the donuts. Remember that old Dunkin' Donuts? Uh, um, <laughs> I remember that commercial? Yeah. And it's just like kind of drudgery. It's a place to go that gives you money and that gives you, uh, you know, your medical benefits and, and things like that to get you through. But these are the people that are just counting the days to retirement because they can't wait to get this over with. And then there is the, uh, and then there is the gen X, Y, Z and, and, uh, um, and of course the baby boomers, which is part of, I don't want to say past generations cause there's, cause they're still in the workforce. Um, but you know, um, many of them are just waiting for the day to be able to retire. 
And, and so there's a gap in, and the Gen XYZ looks at what's called conscious capitalism, which is, um, has been growing through the years and we'll get more into what that is. But I'm going to give you some information on the different generations and how they make up the, the population. So the baby boomer, boomers were born between 1944 and 1964. And, uh, generally so they're 55 to 75 years old and there's there's 76 million in the United States but they're also the largest growing population that's retiring and their skill set is going to need to be replaced and all of the people that are being hired are then from the other generations which are the Gen X um, which are also some call, kind called the Xennials. Uh, they were born between 1965 and 1979, and they're generally 40 to 50 years old, 54 years old, and there's 82 million in the United States alone. So then there's the Millennials or the Gen Y, and they were born between 1980 and 1994, and they're 25 to 39 years old. There are uh, there's a total of 73 million, but it's broken out that the 25 to 29, there's 31 million, and the, the 29 year olds, the 39 year olds, are, there's 42 mil million. And that's really the, you know, it's kind of the sweet spot because they've been in the workforce for a while, they are experienced, um, you know, and, but they also think very differently. Uh, from the Gen X and the baby boomers. Mm -hmm. And then there's the Gen Z, which was born between 1995 and 2015. Uh, they are between four years old and 24 years old. So, you know, the workforce portion of it's really, you know, getting out of college or out of college maybe for a year or so. And there's 74 million of them in the United States. They're 25% of the population. So between the Gen, the Gen Z and the millennials, which are the Gen Y, they make up 50% of the population. Wow. Which, which, yeah, which is huge. And we hadn't really thought about it that way. So you can see why, because if you know any of them and you just watch and you see that they think very differently, they act very differently and they look at business very differently as well. What they're looking for in a company and their skills and how they look to, uh, to give back. And so this brings us to the conscious capitalism model, which is the model that many companies for quite some time have been moving towards. So the, these are companies, I'm going to, I'll explain the model to you, but these are companies that you know and have heard of. They're, they're Whole Foods, the Container Store, um, uh, Virgin, Richard Branson's Virgin, uh, First United Bank and Trust, Studio, Studio Movie Grill, Dale Carnegie, Dow, Clear Software, Wells Fargo Advisors, Panera Bread, um, LAZ Parking, The Motley Fool, um, which for those of you that don't know, uh, they are stock advisors. Mm -hmm. um, and and come and another kind of Clark uh, Clark with an E on the end, but that's just some. That that's not all of them. That's just some that that you might know about. And it is really the um, it is the the business model of the future because it's the balanced approach between capitalism and socialism. So. In, in conscious capitalism, the model is about putting people first, whereas the model uh, that we talked about previously was about putting profits first. This model is about putting people first, your, your uh, clients and your employees. It's about caring about the planet. It's about uh, doing good for the planet. Does your product, does your service do good? Does it, does it do something good? Um, for for people and the planet uh, uh, as a whole, because if it if you have those two things blended together as your secret ingredients, your profits will naturally come. Mm 
And not only that, your profits and your revenue will grow because people like who you are as a company. You're not the person they have to do or the company that they have to do business with. And they're like, I really don't like what they stand for. I don't like, uh, you know, much, much about them or their profit or, or, or their products, but I have to use them because it suits my needs until someone, something else comes along. Mm -hmm. And these younger, uh, I feel very old saying these younger generations, <laughs> but the newer generations will say <laughs> the more recent, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm I'm a boomer. I'm a <laughs> the more recent generation. That 50% of the population looks for this model of who they want to work for. They don't look at who is going to pay me the most. They look at who has the most in common with who I am. Oh, that's with, a good point. Right. It's it's huge. So. Um, they want to know that you care about them as people and that you have something in common with them. So the, the four tenets of conscious capitalism, and there's, there's an organization that's been in effect for, oh, uh, a lot of years. It's, it's, I don't work for them, but it's consciouscapitalism.org. Uh, uh, they're up out of San Francisco. I, I went to their global event in Phoenix, and which was just amazing to meet the chairman of the board, John Mackey of Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. and, the chairman of Panera Bread, Ron Shake, and the chairman of uh, the Container Store, um, uh, Kip Tendall, and uh, all these people are on their are on the board of, of Conscious Capitalism. So the four tenets of Conscious Capitalism and what it means is that you have a you have a higher purpose in your company. You're knowing why your business exists, and profit is a means to the end of purpose for conscious businesses. It's, it's, um, and, and so then we talk about, uh, stakeholder orientation, stakeholder orientation means everyone in your ecosystem. Your, uh, it, it's about businesses that operate from an ecosystem of employees, customers, suppliers, investors, society, and environment. Sometimes it even means including in that your competition. But conscious businesses value and care for everyone in their ecosystem uh, to motivate the stakeholders for it to be a win, win, win outcome for all, all who are part of it. Now, the, which leads to how do you develop, uh, you know, cultures like this is by, is by having conscious leadership. You know, conscious leadership believes in empowerment versus the old structure of what's called command control, mm -hmm. um, which is more of a military term you think of. Um, uh, but, but what that means is that you look to empower your people versus just telling them what to do. You look towards when they come to you to ask you about something or ask you how to do something, you ask them questions like, well, you, you consider it a coachable moment for them in their growth and development. And while it's easy to just tell them what to do, they're never going to be able to figure it out later on. Well, never, I don't want to say never, but they'll have to always keep coming back to you, which also leads them very dependent upon you and your time and your calendar. Mm -hmm. So if you use it as a coachable moment and you ask them things like, well, what, you know, uh, how would you handle this? How do you think that this should, should be done? Um, uh, what is it that you would like to um, see value in this and how would you put value into it? So, so conscious leaders inspire positive transformation and bring out the best in those around them. And I would assume that just having that mindset of, of being a conscious leader, you're not threatened by the talent around you. You're actually uh, invigorated and excited about having talent around that you can share the wealth with. Absolutely. Because a leader is meant, and this is where the term servant leadership comes from. Leaders are there to support their team. They're there to help grow them as individuals and their career. So they're not threatened if they get a promotion and go to another team mm -hmm. because that's really that they, they did a job well done. 
they, they helped grow that person so that that person could be considered and then awarded the promotion someplace else in the organization. Um, you know, they, conscious leaders keep the business focused on its higher purpose. They, they look to support the people within the organization to create value for all of the organization's stakeholders. And they recognize that culture is an integral role. So in looking at conscious culture and what it means to have a conscious culture, it's about really, you know, embodying the values, principles, and practices underlying the social fabric of a business, signaling how business is to be done. The culture is of your business is your heartbeat. It's your soul. It's, it's what your business is about. And without a, whole, a healthy one, you'll ultimately fail. So I pose the question, how healthy is the soul of your business? Yeah. Uh-oh. All right, I, I can't advance the slide again. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's craziness going on, I tell you. <laughs> It's the phases of the moon. <laughs> it is. It is. It's actually, I did want to say, I didn't want to sound too woo-woo for people. The, um, but I have a very strong woo-woo side to me. The, um, uh, is, uh, Mercury is retrograde from July 7th through the 31st, and, and Mercury controls commerce and technology. Oh, no. <laughs> Which is why people's, their, their technology goes wonky, things, there's always something going wrong. So here we are back and forth and we're jumping, we're trading and sharing of the, uh, of the technology and, and being able to advance the slides. Right. <laughs> so, so people ask me, you know, um, about uh, how to change their culture and, and how do you get there in starting to move forward towards a conscious culture? And I have something that's, uh, you know, um, put in letters to be able to understand called the Vestpar keys. And, and so Vestpar, it, each letter stands for something. And the V is about your values. And your values um, really are your company brand. And, and it's not your product. It's, it's the brand of who you are. Hmm. And, and, and your ethics is about how you do business. Can people trust you and your brand? Servancy is the S, and it's for uh, what I was just talking about earlier about uh, uh, um, uh, leadership uh, uh, servants um, and or servancy as, as as a term. And you know, I give you an example, one that I've remembered for years. I worked for a vice president uh, at a at a certain company, and. Um, he made it look so easy. And I said to him, I'm, John, I'm like, John, how, uh, you know, you make it look so easy. How do you do it? And he's like, well, it, oh, it wasn't always. I had to work on it a lot. But he understood that he was there to support his team. Mm -hmm. And so at one of, you know, companies have uh, president's clubs and, and that kind of thing. And I was one of the people that went on his team and there was a cruise. and. Uh, we were out on the cruise and as each of the vice presidents got up and introduced their teams, they were like, I'm so-and-so and I'm the, I'm, uh, you know, I'm responsible and the leader of this area and blah, blah, blah. And it was kind of more of all about beating their chest and about them. And then they were like, the people that work for me that are here today winning are, you know, and they'd say all the names. But when it was John's turn, he, he, you know, he said his name and he was like, you know, I'm the... Uh, I'm the North American Vice President of Sales, and I am in support of, and he introduced all of us. I never forgot that moment in how he handled that, yeah. how he recognized and wanted all of his people to know that he understood that he was there in support of us to help us grow, to help us become successful. That's what... Um, servant leadership means and and is all about um and then for the t and best part there's trust 
And so what's going on in the back of people's subconscious minds all the time, everyone we meet, whether it's business or whether it's personal, uh, in, in interactions is there's a, there's a quick exchange in the back of our minds going, can I trust you with me? How much of me can I share with you? Hmm. Yeah. As, as, as opposed, so you, uh, to understand how much you're go of yourself, you're going to expose to yeah. someone. How much of that uh, of yourself are you going to let them in on? Are you going to let them know about? And even more so in business and, 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 and at work. But it is the key as we move forward. And I talk about these other things. It really is the key to building trust and to getting to know your people, which, which comes to personal power. Your personal power is is the seat of who you are. Mm -hmm. It's your it's your area of self-esteem and self-worth. Has to do with your boundaries. Are you always giving in? Or do you know your value? Do you know um, what you're capable of? And, and can you project that? You can tell the difference in people that are standing in their personal power as they walk into a room. You can have your back to them, but as they walk into a room, you, you sense and you feel something and people naturally turn around. It's, it's, the, it's the personal power and standing in their personal power and confident with it that they are, um, that they are projecting to others. They're the people that you want to be around because, because they're confident and they're, uh, they're, they're confident just exudes and comes off of them. I don't mean in a cocky way. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a different thing. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> but you you know, as you start to think about personal power, so are you standing in yours, or have you given it away? Mm -hmm. That's something to to really think about, and uh, and is key as well, both yourself and as you think about maybe your team or people you work with, um, people you work for. That has to do with um, the the um, the the servant uh, leader uh, being confident and being conscious in who they are and not being threatened by by the other people around them. And then there's acknowledge. Do you acknowledge your employees for their unique skills and who they are for the reason that you hired them? Do you know who they are as a person? You know, there's, there's something going on that um, for even the last couple of years, so many of my clients and, and that I work with there, there's something about acknowledgement um, and, uh, and, and, and respect and acknowledging people for who they are. And it is, and what and and it's a it's about a belonging thing in the acknowledgement. It's what I call the longing for the belonging syndrome that that's really going on out there because people don't see who you really are and don't acknowledge who you are. But it's also because people are like, "Can I trust you with me?" They're hiding, mm -hmm. so it's hard to acknowledge people if they're not going to be forthcoming with who they are, and it it it, it becomes uh, a circle that that kind of goes round and round, you just can't kind of get, get off of it. But they're looking for the acknowledgement and, and acknowledging them and who they are, they're looking for the respect. Do you let them use those skills that, that you hired them for? That's a key to employee engagement because people, people are more engaged if you let them be who they are and you value who they are and you value what they bring to the table. And I would imagine even more so with that one statistic that you, uh, that you shared with us about 50% of the workforce now being, you know, of a, a much younger generation, these are very important things to them. They're past the, I need a job to survive uh, type of, of mindset. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That they, they, um, they are, if you could advance the slide, 
you won't do it for me again. There you go. Thank you. And so, see, you were very. Oh, yeah. To the next slide. The, um, of course, I love this slide where he's sitting on the, on the boardroom table. Yeah. Meditating, you know, of, um, uh, but the Gen XYZ for employee engagement, that is all the best bar keys. And uh, the, the questions I was asking me, how do you get to know your employee? Mm -hmm. You know, it's about powering what's inside them when you know them to gain their mind share, their productivity, and their innovation. It's as simple as bringing your team out to lunch and having a more of a social conversation. Starting the conversation off with, you know, if you have a dog in the in your family, if you own a dog, and saying, you know, we, uh, we have, uh, you know, we we love animals, and and you know, we have we have a dog or a cat or whatever, and same so, so and then ask him, do, do any of you have have a dog or a cat, or or talking about travel? You know, I'm excited. My next vacation's coming up, and we're going to be traveling here. We love to travel and find out and learn about other places and other cultures. Um, uh, do any of you like to do that? You know, it's kind of uh, simple, general uh, conversations without doing, um, you know, without getting overly personal and prying, of course. But in and this, these are ways to find out who they are. And it's also then, uh, you know, having them start to um, build a deeper relationship with them. So they're dropping their guard. They're trusting you more. They're trusting you more with them and who they are and vice versa. Because when that happens, people want to work harder for people that they naturally like. Mm -hmm. It's all the difference in the world of, I always say, you know, when you're getting up in the, uh, you're your team, your employees getting up in the morning, they don't feel good. They have, there's a cold coming on. And, you know, if they really like the person that, that they're working for and uh, have a, have a great relationship and rapport with that person, they're going to be like, you know, it's not that bad yet. I'm going to go in and uh, I'm gonna work versus if they don't like who they work for because they feel like, well, they don't, they don't care about me. They don't, they don't bother to get to know me. Why should I care about them? And they're like, nah, I'm not gonna go in. I'm, I'm gonna stay home. <laughs> so really, when you think about it, you know, I mean, each of us as individuals is, is kind of like that. And, and we, we think in those terms. So if you really think about it in terms of your employees and uh, understanding what's inside of them so, to gain mind share. Um, and it also builds that acknowledge and respect because mm -hmm. if, if you understand who they are, and you're gaining their mind share and their productivity and, and their innovation, you're, you're also letting them know that you acknowledge them for who they are and you respect and you value what they bring to the table. Everyone wants to be valued for what they bring to the table. Mm -hmm. nice. Next slide, please. So uh, that brings us to, um, you know, environments of empowerment prosper. And you can see why for all of the reasons that I said about having common goals, common purposes, uh, so that you can get uncommon results. You can see how um, in having a culture uh, of uh, conscious capitalism and putting people first, both your, your clients and an understanding what their needs and requirements are and what they're looking for in learning about and understanding your employees and what it is that they're looking for can really grow uh, and drive your revenue and generate what it is that you're looking for. Next slide. Okay, so um, we're getting more into uh, the summary of everything that we talked about today. So 
in order to get uh, an engagement model and uh, one that will have your company and your teams, uh, you know, prosper for decades to come, you want to flip your business model uh, to one of conscious capitalism. When I say flip it, you know, you see where I have here where it says, oh, it says plant instead of planet. Um, uh, plus people equal profits. It's supposed to be planet. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you can have plants around the office too, you know? There you go, yeah. <laughs> Greenery's nice. Oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> Equals profits instead of having just all I care about is the profits. You're, you know, you're, you're just here to, to make me the profits. People, mm -hmm. who wants to feel like that? Nobody wants to feel like that. Design, so you design a, design a conscious culture. Understand who your employee really is inside. Hire employees with a personal purpose that's aligned with your company's brand, your why. What, you know, and I understand many people listening to this and it might, might be working for corporations, um, but if you're in a leadership position and you start to bring up uh, or bring up the chain into, into your corporation, um, you know, many, like I said, uh, more and more larger size companies are looking at this, especially, um, uh, especially since, you know, there's so much going on out there, um, about people protesting. One of the things I heard at Conscious Capitalism, one of the chairman of the board of one of those companies that I mentioned, actually it was the one from Panera Bread, he said, you know, what keeps CEOs up at night and what they're thinking about is when are the activists going to come for me? Oh, wow. Powerful. Yeah. Extremely powerful. And this is why now is the time to seize a model of conscious capitalism and, and to flip it because you're looking, you know, those statistics, 50% of the population are the people that are going to come for you or not work for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, put it in other words, if they're not activists, you know, they're not going to want to work for you and your company will dissolve. Wow. So that's why I said in the beginning, in the first slide, it's not the employee engagement at only 15%. It's not getting any better. It's not going to get any better, but these are the steps and how yours can get better. So hire employees with, with a personal purpose that's aligned with your company's uh, brand. And as I said, you know, that generation is interested in purpose and doing good over just paying them more money. You know, what, what's interesting about that Gallup survey is the first, they do that survey, you know, every, I don't know if it's every year, or every couple of years, but mm -hmm. I remember the first time I was aware of that survey was probably back in the early 2000s. And the number was, at the time, we thought dismal, but it was way higher than what it is now. So mm -hmm. not only is it not going to get any better, it's just continuing to get worse because it seems like we just do the same thing over and over again. We follow the same model and, and expect some sort of a different outcome. Absolutely. Um, but if you really think about everything that I said, and this is something I, I help uh, companies do and, and work with and um, you know, I, I help companies invent new products and services that not only uh, serve and support their, their clients and their employees, but also solve world problems. Hmm. That's what that 50% of um, the Gen Z and the millennials are looking for. Right. And when people say, they, cause they say to me, Lynn, because I know there's a lot of people listening that are like, well, how do you do that? That does both and solves world problems. That's always the question that I get. They're like, wow, how do you do that? And I'm like, okay, well, you know, I, this was not my client cause a lot of my clients are under, uh, I have non-disclosure agreements with them, but, um, but people will understand this when I give this example of that. So if you think about Tom's shoes, mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't know of them and you look them up, their Tom's shoes model is that uh, they sell shoes. So not only do they sell shoes, but for every pair of shoes someone buys, they donate shoes to the barefoot of the world. 
Mm -hmm. So they're solving a world problem uh, of helping the barefoot get shoes. That is the kind of thing when I say that your product and service not only support your employees and uh, and serve your your clients and your employees in their per in their purpose and um, who it is that you are and what you do, but also solves a world problem. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So we are coming uh, to the end. I still cannot. Uh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I always say that mindfulness is your most progressive technology out there today. Uh, you know, and business really can change the world. Um, and the reason that I say that and that it's in business's hands is because business is uniquely positioned to solve world problems uh, because of their size, their scale, their scope, their geographic diversity of employees and locations around the world. You know, you know it all ties together um, in terms of what I was saying of ser to serve and to achieve your, your profits. Because of course, let's face it, I mean, businesses, you know, they're not only in business to serve and, and, but they want, but they want profits, your profits drive off your revenue and your employee engagement. And so let's look at ways that you can get your employees and that 50% of the generation, the, the Gen Z's and the millennials, or they're called the Gen Y's, um, uh, more engaged and wanting to work for you. Nice. Very nice. Okay. You can advance. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. That's me. Great. <laughs> Maybe I should have had a picture of me up the front on the front side. I don't know. <laughs> so well, you're listening to. Yeah. For everybody listening, this is how you can get a hold of Lynn and how, uh, how you can find out more about her and the work that she does. But there are a couple of questions, Lynn. And, and one is, so let's imagine that a business leader is listening to this webinar and they're thinking, I'm not sure if I've created an environment like this or not. How, how would they know? Ah, good question. So, um, well, uh, they, they would know by, uh, do they have the three ingredients? Do they put people first? Does their product and service, their company uh, do something for the planet? Uh, giving back, um, you know, solving a world, uh, uh, solving a world problem also, or in, if your product doesn't necessarily do that in your philanthropy approach, do you give a portion of your profits? Do you give a portion of your time? There's companies out there that have, um, that give benefits of like, you know, uh, in, instead of like a, um, uh, what is it that I'm trying to think of? Not your vacation time, your floater days, mm -hmm. uh, that they also, aside from those days, they give a day for someone to go out and do volunteer work. Yeah. For either something the company is interested in and is at the heart of, or what that employee what what is in the heart of the employee of uh, of the of the volunteering time to to give back? Mm -hmm. Those are some of the things to look at. Do you have conscious leaders? Are your leaders empowering their teams? Are they in the old structure of command control and just telling them what to do versus nurturing and empowering them for who they are and recognizing their value? You know, I think that um, where a company spends its money, you know, it's kind of like what you say, put your money where your mouth is. And I worked for a while for um, a wonderful company up in the Bay Area called Autodesk. And every employee was given so many days a year to volunteer. And you just, you know, it was on your calendar. You could go 
uh, build a house for Habitat for Humanity or go work with guide dogs of the blind or, you know, whatever your passion happened to be. Mm -hmm. And they also had a share, uh, a financial share. If you had a, uh, an organization that you wanted to support, a nonprofit, you know, that you wanted to support, whatever money you gave to that organization, they would match that. And it was, it was just such, it was so empowering, but also you could tell that it was part of the company's DNA, that they, they really put their money and their effort and their energy where, you know, where their mouth was. So um, that, to me, that was a wonderful exam, uh, example of conscious capitalism. Absolutely. There's, there's another really good example, um, salesforce.com. Yes, I, yes. I was in information technology for, you know, 25, 28 years, worked for uh, Fortune 500 companies in information technology. And um, salesforce.com is also headquartered up in, up in San Francisco in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. And they also have that model of giving people time off, uh, donating, but they also have in their annual kickoff meetings um, for employees, they, you know, they, they have the standard about, you know, products and learning and all that stuff. But, and on, uh, on their last day, they have a mindfulness day. Yeah. Yeah. And they bring in people to present about mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to move, uh, to move in that culture. And there, uh, Mark Benioff is the, one of the founders and CEO, and he's very interested in, uh, uh, in, in the, in the philanthropy and helping and giving back area. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He does uh, a fabulous job up here. Very, very inspirational. Mm -hmm. Um, let me ask you this. How, how would a leader go about empowering their team like one of the things that you said in your slide was uh, when you were looking at the Vespar um, model that people feel recognized they feel acknowledged they feel um, respected and so forth so you probably would know if your team felt that way by how willing they were to speak up or express an idea. Um, are there other tips you could give a leader for how to begin to build that empowered team? Um, well, absolutely. So uh, fostering a culture uh, in your team of knowing uh, and having your employees know that you're interested in what it is they think and what it is they feel and bring to the table is extremely important. It's important in terms of uh, acknowledging who they are, trusting their opinions, valuing, uh, valuing their knowledge and, re and respecting it. It, it hits f four key areas right off the bat without even uh, thinking about all of the other parts to it. So team meetings should be more of um, not, it's what I call don't speak at them, speak mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. Ask, uh, it, you know, if there's, if there's a, um, a project or a challenge in the team, ask people, uh, don't, don't just tell people, all right, I want you to do this and you to do this and you to do this. And because you're the only person that then came up with the idea of how to solve it. And it may not be the best idea, right? Be humble enough to know that other people have great ideas and, um, uh, and this is how you empower and pull the best out of people. And as you're pulling the best out of them, it gets them more engaged because they're like, oh, they really care about what I have to say. And, and then if that person has the best idea and you're asking, well, do you want to lead this project then? And, you know, it becomes more of a collaboration and it becomes more of a team voting on what's the best idea nice. and people know and then people see that oh they don't only think their idea is the best and it's not it's it's not just pushed at us mm -hmm. it's a it's a pull versus a push model 
Mm -hmm. You're pulling the best out of people. And when you do, their brains are thinking more. They're, they're being more innovative. They're being more productive. And it wants them and encourages them to continue down that road of, of continually thinking, of being more innovative and being more productive. Hmm. Yeah, Ken Blanchard used to say, let your people bring their brains to work. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, you know, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm a, a blend of, of corporate experience and business acumen. I, I'm an ICF credentialed coach. So, you know, there's a lot of coaching brought in that. And then, and then there's my deep intuitive side, um, of helping people in invent, uh, products and services and, and getting them into their flow zone. So the, you know, I come from the, I, I didn't go to the Ken Blanchard school, but I, I come from all of that kind of bundled together yeah. um, in, in being able to help and move not only individuals, teams and leaders and, but and companies forward. But that was, that was a, uh, Patty, that was an excellent example that you gave of, of Ken Blanchard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Lynn, this has been really, really fascinating. Is there anything else that you would like to share with us um, before we, we close out our time today? No, other than, you know, just offer to people, if you'd like to reach out to me, if you have any questions, um, please feel free to email me, go to my website, or my phone number uh, is there. You can, you can contact me, and, I, and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Well, thank you again so much, Lynn. And that's Lynn Brody at www.lynnbrody.com. And that's Lynn with an E. And I encourage all of you to reach out to her and learn more about her business and what she can do for you. And just let's keep this conversation about conscious capitalism going because let's face it, folks, the world is changing. Our generations are changing and what we're doing now just isn't working. So let's open our minds to something different. And for all of you that, that were with us today and those of you that listened to the, the replay later on, um, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. And stay tuned for our next Women Lead webinar. We do these on a monthly basis uh, for CWI and always a wonderful, wonderful time. I'm your host, Patty Vargas. Thank you for joining us. And Lynn, thank you so much again for sharing your wisdom with us today. Oh, thank you, Patty. And thank you for having me. I, I so appreciate helping everyone. Okay. Take care, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day.